Well, you know, this is the time of year where certain people, they begin, they begin thinking about uh, New Year's resolutions. Anybody here make New Year's resolution? Anybody ever do that? Not really? Gave it up? <laughs> well, that's one of the things that people like to do. Um, I was looking at this article, Why We Make New Year's Resolutions and Why We Should by Glenn E. Miller, M.D. And it said in the article, the number one reason people give for not making New Year's resolutions is that they will, what do you think? They will break them. They, that's right. I heard it over there, Marianne said. And that's what it says. They will fail to keep them. So that's reason. And it goes on. There is no need for me to go into the numerous personal examples of this, the writer says. Suffice it to say that despite this fact, New Year resolutions are something that should be made, and here is why. Making resolutions sets forth a personal challenge. It is human nature to become contented with our lot in life, maintaining the status quo, if you would. By making well-conceived resolutions, you are able to explore your personal potential and continue to grow as an individual and a productive member of society. It continues, the article goes on to say, making resolutions obliges us to take stock in where we are and how we can improve. The start of a new year, a new beginning, is a natural time for us to reflect and evaluate our lives. Have I been the kind of person I would like to be? Is there an area in my life that I would like to work on to improve? Is there something I have dreamed of doing to improve myself or my lot in life for quite some time now? And then it also says making Resolution signifies our desires to take a step toward positive change, even if we are unsuccessful in making all the changes we hope to, actually making a resolution will at least focus us and take us a step, take us a few steps forward. As far as I'm concerned, that is a lot better than just doing nothing. And so that's what the, the article says. What do you think? Does it make sense? Or doesn't make too much of a difference? There is this quote in the article that says, um, making resolutions is a cleansing ritual for self-assessment and repentance that demands personal honesty and ultimately reinforces humility. Breaking them is part of the cycle. Interesting quote, this is by Eric Zahn, or no, Eric Zorn, I believe. That's an interesting quote. And so people feel the need, whether they're Christians or atheists or whatever they are, they feel the need to be cleansed and to repent. People feel that need and this demands personal honesty and humility. And people oftentimes, whether they're atheists or unbelievers or whatever they are, oftentimes people have that need if they could start over again. Do you think that's a general feeling that people sometimes have? I wish I could just start over again. I wish I could do it over again. Uh, sometimes a, a person may have something in their past and they just wish they could start all over again. Well, the Bible reveals that in Christ you can start all over again. And the world might not recognize that. The world might not see that. They might not acknowledge 
that you're a new creation, you're a new creature, but all that matters is what God knows. That's what matters, what God knows. Not, not what the world says. They might say, oh, I knew you when you did this, and I knew you when you did that. But the Bible reveals you can be born again. You can be a new creature, a new creation. And so today I want to talk a little bit about baptism. Baptism. And this is based on fundamental belief number 15. This is fundamental belief number 15. I'll just read that belief uh, right from the outset. It says, by baptism, we confess our faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and testify of our death to sin and of our purpose to walk in newness of life. Thus, we acknowledge Christ as our Lord and Savior, uh, become his people and are received as members by his church. Baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ, the forgiveness of our sins and our reception of the Holy Spirit. It is by immersion in water. It's not a, not a little bit of sprinkling on the head, but it says clearly, immersion in water and is contingent on an affirmation of faith in Jesus and evidence of repentance of sin. It follows instruction in the Holy Scriptures and acceptance of their teachings. So I want to look a little bit about baptism, a little further into baptism and into the roots of baptism as well. Where does it come from? When did it start? How did it come about? What does it mean? Well, I first want to take a look in the book of Acts, chapter 19. Let's turn to Acts, chapter 19. And when you're there, please say amen. Acts, chapter 19. Okay. I heard a couple of amens. And here I am in Acts, chapter 19. I'm just going to read from verse number 1 to 6, and it says... And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So they didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. Let's continue, verse 3. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Into John's baptism. And so we could see here, there's a difference between John's baptism and the baptism that Jesus spoke about at the end of Matthew chapter 28. There's a difference. There, and we're going to look at, in a sense, this kind of this history of baptism in the Bible, into John's baptism. So they didn't even hear about the Holy Spirit, but they knew about John's baptism. What was that about? And Paul said to them, John indeed baptized with a baptism of what? Repentance. Repentance. Is repentance important? Yes. But the meaning of baptism deepened deepened since the baptism of John. Let's continue. Saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. In other words, John was saying to the people when John was baptizing that they should believe on who? On Jesus, right? John was preparing the way for whom? For Jesus. He was preparing the way. And so it says, and that is on Jesus Christ. And then it says, when they heard this, they were baptized. So they were baptized again in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see? So first they were baptized with John's baptism. Now they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And didn't Jesus say, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? And so when Paul, and that, this is right, these are newly baptized people we're talking about. 
And then this is interesting what it says. When Paul had laid hands on them. So, as you know, sometimes in the Adventist church, we lay hands on people when there's ordination. There's the laying on of hands. But we also have laying on of hands right here of newly baptized people. You see that? Were these newly baptized people? Verse number six says, when Paul had laid hands on them, what happened? The Holy Spirit came upon them. And then what happened? They spoke with tongues and prophesied. You see, and so laying on of hands, that's one of the things that I do when I, when I baptize. I lay hands on the newly baptized people to signify that they have a mission. That they have a purpose. They have to discover what their gift is. But everybody who's baptized into the body of Christ, does the Holy Spirit give them a gift? Or does he only give certain people gifts? Everybody. And does everybody have a purpose in the body of Christ? Everybody has a purpose. And so we might not know what that gift is, what that mission is that God has for those newly baptized people. Now, in the case of these people, it was seen immediately. They received this gift of tongues immediately. They received the, the gift of tongues. Isn't that something? Because that was what was needed at the time. That was a, the gift that was needed at the time. And so they spoke, spoke with tongues, but it also says they also prophesied. And so they received this powerful blessing of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at the little bit of the context of John's baptism. Let's go to Luke chapter 3. And when you're there, please say amen. Luke chapter 3. Anybody there yet? Okay, so Luke chapter 3. I'm just going to start. You know, Luke chapter 3 is a very, very interesting uh, chapter. Because right in the beginning of the chapter, we have historical personalities and specific details of the time of when Christ was baptized, showing that the New Testament is rooted in history. And if there wasn't a first century audience for the writings of the New Testament who could know of these events and individuals, um, and if the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ had been unverified or falsified, Christianity would have never had a chance. These are specific details that are, that are spoken. And this is a very good example of it. Here we see, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia, and the region of Trichonitis, and I'm sorry, <laughs> these names are not so easy to pronounce. Uh, Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. So all of these, as you can see, specifics are, are given right from the outset of the chapter. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. So you can see from what I'm reading here, uh, all those details are given. So do you think it's th that there's a reason why all those specific details are given? Do you think there might be something very important about the time, the times that we're talking about, of the baptism of Jesus, which this, this chapter deals with? Uh, what, the, the baptism of Jesus, and when Jesus began his earthly ministry, did that have any prophetic importance, and was time involved with that? That's a, another sermon, but at the end of Daniel chapter 9, we have the 70-week prophecy. And so this does tie into that. And so all of these historical details are there for a purpose. But let's leave that aside for now. Let's continue here and continuing with the, the ministry of John the Baptist. And in verse 3 it says, And he went into the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of what? Repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book 
of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So this is a fulfillment of prophecy, John's mission and his, his ministry of baptism. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. And then it continues. And then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him. Now listen to what he said and think about this. Uh, brood of vipers. Would that be a good way to, to open a sermon? Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? They're coming to him to get baptized. And this is what he says to them. Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. In other words, don't take pride in the blood of man, but eventually he's pointing them to the blood of Christ. And so he's, he's trying to tell them, look, don't, don't think that God uh, supports some kind of, of elitism to say, well, I'm part of a special group or a, I've got a pedigree. Uh, Abraham is my father. He's, he's telling them that they have to repent. And he's using very strong language to say that. And then he continues. And he says, For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So it's very powerful language that, that John is using. And we have to keep in mind, John is there to prepare the way for who? For Jesus. Was the Holy Spirit leading John to say those things? Well, that's the, what I would call tough love. I want to go backward now. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 8. Again, want to look a little bit about the history of baptism, maybe the roots of baptism. I briefly mentioned the baptism of Christ. And then we looked at the baptism of John. But let's go backward in the Bible. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 8. And when you're there, please say amen. Leviticus chapter 8. And I'm just going to look over here in Leviticus chapter 8 from 1 to 6. Now this is dealing with, I'm reading from the New King James here. And this is dealing with Aaron and his sons consecrated. So this is a consecration of the priests of the Old Testament. Of the old covenant. And it says here. Verse, starting the beginning of Leviticus 8. It says. And the Lord said to Moses saying. Take Aaron and his sons with him. And the garments. The anointing oil. A bull. As a sin offering. Two rams. And a basket of unleavened bread. So all of these things were ne necessary in this ritual. And gather all the congregation together. At the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And so Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And the congregation was gathered together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And Moses said to the congregation, this is what the Lord commanded to be done. And then Moses brought Aaron and his sons and he washed them in water. And so the washing was a key part of this. And as we continue to look at in this uh, chapter, he says he washed them with water. So there's this washing. Let's go to verse 7. And he put the tunic on them. So now there's new, new clothing put on them, the tunic. The priestly garments are put on them after the washing. And this, and I'm just going to, I'll explain this, but basically what we're seeing here that's happening to this, these priests is going to relate to us as believers. I'll, I'll explain that as I continue. 
But let's let's look at this. So first there's the washing, and then he's, he puts on the, the, the clothing on them, the tunic, and girded him with the sash and clothed him with the robe, and he put the ephod on him, and he girded him with the intricacy woven band, so all of these new garments of the ephod, and with it tied the ephod on him. And then he put the breastplate on him, and he put the urim and the thummim in the breastplate. And in verse 9 it says, and he put the turban on his head. Also on the turban, on his front, he put the golden plate. And so all of these garments he puts, as we can see, put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And then it says in verse 10, and Moses took the anointing oil. So we now see the, so the first the washing and then the clothing and then the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle. And so the tabernacle is anointed and all that was in it and consecrated them. So all areas of the tabernacle, everything was consecrated. The most holy place, the holy place. Oh, that's very important to keep that in mind. But let's continue. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, anointed the altar with all its utensils and the laver and his base, consecrate them, to consecrate them. And then it says, and he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. So we see that he consecrates Aaron and puts the anointing oil on him as well. And so we're seeing here this consecration. And so we saw the washing and then we saw the clothing and then we saw the anointing oil. And all this is going to be very important to believers in Christ as we're going to see. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. When you're there, please say amen. Revelation 1. Amen? Amen? Let's look at verse 5 and 6 of Revelation chapter 1. And here we see in Revelation chapter 1. Now I just began reading about the consecration of Aaron. And I didn't continue reading. But if we go back there to, before I go, to, go on to Revelation. But if we go back there to Leviticus, where I was in Leviticus chapter 8. One of the things it says is Aaron and his sons consecrated. Aaron and his sons. So I just began reading there. I didn't continue. But let's look at Revelation 1, 5 and 6. And it says here, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and then it says, what does it say? Washed us from our sins in what? in his own blood, and then it says, and made us kings and priests, kings and priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the Bible is saying that the believers in Christ are what? Kings and what? And priests. And so those things that we were looking at in Leviticus relate to, to New Testament believers. Well, I want to talk about the oil. As you remember, I mentioned the oil. Let's look in the book of Acts chapter 10. Let's take a look over there. Acts chapter 10. When you're there, please say amen. Acts chapter 10, and we will look at verse 38. And the word of God says there, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the what? With the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. So we can clearly see what did that anointing oil of the Old Testament represent? Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and when you're there, please say amen, 1 John chapter 2, 
Okay, so here in chapter 2, let's look at verse number 20. And it says there, and the word of God tells us, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And let's jump down to verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing, look at this language, that the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. Now, who is it that would lead us into all truth? The Holy Spirit. That's the anointing we're talking about. And just to, to remind ourselves, if we go to the Gospel of John, let me turn over there, the Gospel of John, chapter 16. John chapter 16. And let's take a look over here. John chapter 16. And let me look at... Um, let's look at verse 13. John 16, 13 says... John chapter 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come... He will guide you into all truth. So that connects. Do you see the connection with that? And what we were just reading in 1 John 2, 27? And so there's a, there is a, the anointing that we receive. The anointing that we receive as God's priests and kings when we are born again, just as the priests of the Old Testament, they were washed, and so that reminds us of what? Baptism, doesn't it? There was the washing. There was the cleansing. We also read of being, our sins being washed away in the blood of Christ. Then we read of anointing. And we read of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want to take a look at something. I'm switching gears a little bit, but really not too much. Let's turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And let's go to 42, verse 42 and 43. Acts chapter 13, verse 42 and 43. There's something I want to kind of look at a little bit in this that, that, that relates as well to this kind of this history of baptism. So if we go all the way back to the Old Testament, we can see the roots in baptism in that process of consecrating the priests. Did you see that? The washing, the ceremonial washing and, and the consecration of the priests is part of the, these roots, so to speak, of baptism. Where did, did John just come up with this on his own? Did John the Baptist just make this thing up? Or was there a history that we are looking at? Well, there is a history. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 13. And if you are, are anybody there yet? Acts chapter 13, 42, 43? Amen. Okay. So it says over here, it says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged, that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So Paul was sharing the gospel, and there were Gentiles there. It wasn't only Jews. And then it says in verse 43, Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes, now that word is what we're going to look at, followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So I just wanted to look a little bit about proselytes. According to the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 8, page 908, it says, a proselyte originally meant a resident alien. A resident alien among the, among the Israelite nation. But it came to mean, it, eventually this word proselyte came to mean a convert after the time of the dispersion. In other words, after the time where the Assyrians uh, took over the northern kingdom and the Babylonians took over the southern kingdom and, and the people were dispersed. After that time, and in the New Testament, proselyte 
was referring to Gentile converts to the Jewish religion. That's what it referred to. And to become a proselyte to Judaism, one had to be baptized. One had to be baptized by immersion. And a male had to be circumcised. So these Gentiles who would become Jews, so to speak, had to get baptized, you see? And so this was a practice. And so in Matthew 23, 15, Jesus says, this is Matthew 23, 15. If you want to turn there, I'm going to read this. Matthew 23, 15. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So he, Jesus was, again, giving this, these very strong words to these hypocrites, to these scribes and Pharisees. But the, the, the main thing I wanted to point out is that this practice of, of winning proselytes and that there was baptism involved in that was something that was going on since uh, before the time of John the Baptist. So when John the Baptist now starts baptizing, we could see, well, there's a, there's a history to this. There's a history to this. And then let's continue with the words of the message today. Let's look in the book of John, John chapter 3, the Gospel of John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and let's start at verse 5. And when you're there, please say amen. John 3 and starting in verse 5. And here the word of God is telling us, Jesus answered. Jesus here is speaking of the new birth. That's My Bible has a little subheading, the new birth. And he's speaking with, who is he speaking with? Nicodemus. Speaking with Nicodemus. And Jesus answered, most assuredly, this is John chapter 3 and verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and the spirit. Now, obviously, Nicodemus was someone who was familiar with the proselyte. He was familiar with these rituals of the Old Testament. And now Jesus is telling him, unless someone is born of water and the spirit. So now he's going deeper into this concept, expanding on this, this concept of baptism. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So now he's talking to someone about being born again, and that someone probably said, well, I, you know, I'm going to... I can understand a, a, a Gentile proselyte needing to, to get washed in water, but I need to be born again. And so this is something new that Jesus is speaking about. And as we continue, let's turn into the book of Colossians. Colossians. We're almost done here with this study, but let's turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse number, we're going to look at verse number 11 and 12. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. And it tells us, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So again, referring to Old Testament concepts, Paul is speaking here. So we, we get to keep that in mind. You see, the Bible some people just take the New Testament, they forget the Old Testament. Some, many Christians do that, right? They don't take the whole of Scripture. But we want to consider the whole of Scripture. And so this is what Paul is doing. He's relating the old with the new. And he says, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. So he's relating these Old Testament concepts to these New Testament ideas. And he says by the circumcision of Christ. And then he says in verse 12, buried with him in baptism, 
buried with him, in other words, buried with Christ in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So here we can very clearly see, and this is a, another concept, we see the Bible um, says, how can you who have died to sin any longer live in it? For do you know, not know that as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have been baptized into his death? And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so shall we also walk in newness of life. And that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. And so baptism is signifying this new life in Christ, the putting away of the old, the new chance that we have, to be born again, to be a new creation, to be a new creature. Let us close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we consider the, this history of baptism and the roots of baptism and the meaning of baptism, to be anointed with the Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit enables us and empowers us to, to do your will, giving us the strength to do your will, I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there is any person here, Lord, today, who has not been baptized, that um, they consider that carefully, Lord. That they, that they realize, Lord Jesus, that you love them with an everlasting love and that in Christ they can be a new creation and be born again. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.